Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Mike Platt. I'm the current president of the AOA. And we've been doing this series of office hours once a month on Sunday evenings. And this is a venue for people, members to come to get any of their questions answered. And initially, uh, these were open ended and didn't have a specific topic. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that would come through. And we've learned over the course of the year that it's often helpful to have a topic to engage in conversation and learn about different things from the panelists as well as the members who the show. And then we also learned that it's, uh, a lot of good useful information comes through and it's helpful to report it and then share it or post it on our website. So welcome everyone, thank you for being here. We expect people will come and go throughout this time period. It may last a whole hour or it may not. The topic for tonight's office hour is the remote practice allergy. And this is not a new topic. I think that the remote practice allergy has been present for many years. I would say maybe even decades and debated over the years. And the pandemic certainly changed things with the speeding up of telehealth, but there's so many aspects to remote practice allergy that were there, were evolving, and have changed over the years. And now that we've gotten through the acute phase of the pandemic, uh, I'd like to have a discussion about what we were doing in the remote practice of allergy, what was considered to be useful things for the future, to learn what we feel is safe and appropriate within the standard of care, and see how things have changed over the years. And so uh, I think that the best way to start off this discussion is just by having a talk about telemedicine. And I personally will be my experience and I share others, but others will share their experience. I didn't use any telemedicine when the pandemic hit. We used it primarily when we were shut down. And now I'm doing half a day every two weeks of telemedicine. And I think I'll do that indefinitely. It's such a great convenience for my patients. I'm able to, I think, provide just as good care to select patients who have follow-ups, follow-ups where I've already done a comprehensive exam. I've already done endoscopy. I understand what's going on. And now it's more of a medication adjustment follow-up. There are also some patients that come as new patients by telemed. Um, because they don't want to travel to see me or difficult to get in and they want to expedite. And I'm able to start a lot of allergy visits. And I don't think it's appropriate to see new patients as well by telemedicine, take a history, talk about certain medical therapies, and get things going before they reach the point where I want to do something else like allergy testing. Dr. Sasser, do you want to start us off? Are you doing any telemedicine? Yeah, we um we were catapulted uh, fairly rapidly into it um, uh, when it was getting more difficult to see patients uh, in person uh, during the pandemic. So we learned um, uh, and, you know, once we kind of got ahead of that learning curve, it, it became great. And I actually found it and find it to be a great way to follow up with allergy patients, people that are on immunotherapy, uh, kind of checking in with them in my usual sort of time frame, um, and, and often they really prefer uh, for the convenience of it, the, the telehealth part. Um, depending on uh, depending on how much technology the patients have, uh, you can even do somewhat of an exam, but. Uh, the downside is the patients that have no technology and it becomes a phone visit, it becomes kind of tricky to do a lot of things, but, but you do the best you can. Um, we um, did uh, continue allergy therapy, patients that were building, uh, patients that were on maintenance therapy, that were on subcutaneous, obviously patients on sublingual immunotherapy continued uh, through the pandemic. Um, and I can speak to that at any point if anybody wants to talk about that, um, how we justified that even at a time when we were trying to limit uh, patients, et cetera. But um, yeah, yeah, um, we've found it quite helpful. The trick is, um, you know, it, I don't think it's necessarily a shorter visit time between the visit and the uh, documentation. I, I think it takes a similar amount of time uh, as an inpatient in-person visit it takes less personnel for sure. Um, takes less, uh, 
bricks and mortar overhead for sure. Um, so there are advantages to the system as well. And do you have a preference for phone versus video? Do you try to steer patients toward one or the other, or do you not have a preference? Yeah, thanks for asking that. I, I really feel like I'm more engaged with the patient on video. Um, so my preference would be an, an audio visual, you know, interaction. Um, on the telephone, I, I just think you lose yet another sort of level of that visit of that of that human interaction. Um, but it's again better than nothing. I, I just want to mention I I believe that um, people have been telling me that actually the telephone visits, uh, straight telephone visits, you can't bill much for those at all, and the the reimbursements really going down or going away possibly even. Uh, whereas the video visits still will be very viable for billing purposes. So that probably plays a factor in choosing. Yeah, I suspect that's the case. Although I think, you know, just like everything else, there's some variability depending on payers, depending on the part of the country, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be yet another transition, <laughs> kind of sorting that piece out. But but by and large, yes, I, I, I believe I've heard the same, uh, the same comments. I, I've heard that as well. And in my telehealth clinic, I might have a dozen patients. And if the next patient doesn't show up by video, my standard is, is that I give them a call and proceed with the phone visit. Do other people do similar things? I mean, I accept that uh, they're not equal in terms of payment. I don't know exactly what the difference is, but I've been told that there's a difference. Is there a default? You know, my, that's my default going from video to just phone if, if patients don't show up. Do others feel similarly or do they, would they rather just let it ride, not do the visit? I agree with, I tend to do what you're doing. Um, and, but I, I suspect that uh, that may become prohibitive in terms of the reimbursement piece. I, I, I think you and I may be in a similar situation. I'm, I'm employed in an academic center. Um, and sometimes it takes the dollars and cents people a little while to kind of catch up to advise us uh, what to do. They have to look at some history for a few months. So I'll hear from them <laughs> uh, soon enough, I'm sure. <laughs> so, so I'm in private practice and we use Doximity. I don't know what your systems are, but the Doximity app is really slick. And so what I am doing, if nobody shows up for that, I call them and then say, hey, you're about to get a text message in the next few minutes and just click on the link. And so then I can quickly convert it to a video visit. One thing that you mentioned, Dr. Platt, which I think is a good idea, is bunching the virtual visits together because I have a hard time, like if I'm running a little bit late, it's a different experience for a patient to wait by their phone than it is to wait in an exam room. So they sort of think I've forgotten about them if I'm running 10 minutes late or something like that. It's a good idea to bunch them back up where I feel like it's easier to probably stay on time with the virtual visits. In our uh, practice setting, when we were setting up telemedicine, we actually made um, a document with a bunch of screenshots showing the patients what to download, how to um, kind of sign in, uh, troubleshooting, all of this sort of stuff that the staff would send to the patients in advance. Um, because yes, it, it, it helps when you kind of walk them through it, but it also is time consuming. And it is a very significant difference, especially in the beginning of the pandemic when we were very heavy on telehealth. Um, uh, so if you're really having to punt too many visits to telephone versus video, it does become a little bit uh, of a bigger chunk of change in terms of the difference in the reimbursement or the difference, you know, in the dollars and cents at the end of the day. So anything that the staff can do up front, especially some of the patients aren't as tech savvy, depending on their, you know, age demographic and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of stuff that the staff can do to kind of help set the visit up. Uh, for success. Um, the other thing from the pediatric perspective, and uh, uh, I um, wanted to know what your advice is with the pediatric visits, you know, sometimes the parents don't recognize that the kids have to be with them. So if you run into the situation where they say, well, little Johnny's in school, right? 
um, and you're asking about the kid, do you guys feel that the telephone, like, let's say you converted just to a telephone chicken, because now you really can't do a video visit because the kid's not physically there. How do you guys handle those situations? Do you bill it as a telephone visit? Or are you kind of out of luck? I, I just want to know what you guys do in those situations. I have not been in that situation. I think my, my response would tend to be, well, let's reschedule it for a day where we can be together or a time when we can be together. Um, it's kind of hard to call that a, a visit with the, the absent patient. <laughs> I had that experience once. It was the mom said that the kid was napping and she was like, do I have to get him up? And I was like, well, yeah, you gotta wake him up or you gotta at least bring him in the room. I don't care if he stays asleep. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I would bill as a telephone call if it wasn't there. I want to underscore the point. Uh, the idea of setting up the visit, having staff help with that, as you would in any visit in an office, um, you might have somebody checking the medication list, um, uh, making sure that the patient notes that this telehealth visit is a real visit, um, that they will get a bill, that you know, there's no surprises about that. Um, and that that uh, it, it's a similar you know sort of standard of care than that we do with any visit. All that stuff we have found to be important. Likewise, the technology piece. It's really nice to have more than one platform to switch to because the patient may not have something that matches up to the platform that you're starting with. I like that Doximity platform as well. We have an Epic uh, uh, system here. The University likes us to use the Epic thing, but I'll, if, if I can't get the patient hooked up to that for technological reasons, I'll switch over to the Doximity as well. So I, I think having more than one, different types of phones sometimes connect into these systems differently, whether it's a, a OS or a, a whatever the other one is. Anyway, um, all of that stuff matters uh, to be able to have a quality visit, I think. I think from a patient selection type of visit, one of the most valuable telehealth visits for me is the follow-up immunotherapy. These are typically patients that come in and they do them every six months. And oftentimes the exam doesn't really mean that much. It's all in the history. And oftentimes patients are doing really well and there isn't much to say. And when they come into the office and have to wait, park, travel, all that, and there's not really that much that happens at the visit, I, I get the sense that they're not very pleased with having to do, go through that. And I get the opposite experience by telemed that, you know, this is a six month checkup. They come on, I ask them all the questions. They're very happy how things are going. We monitor the symptoms and it's a very successful visit. So for me, that's like an optimal visit, follow up immunotherapy that I'm required to do it and track it. And it can all be done by telemed. Do other people have similar experience with that? Yeah, that's my favorite type of telemed visit. And I would say that the opposite to that is, is that, you know, I think I spend a good part of my life trying to figure out if someone has allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, or something strange going on. And an uh, essential key to doing that is looking inside the nose. And all of those patients, I end up using an endoscope, and it helps you make that decision of what's going on. And that initial patient, it's great if it's mostly allergy symptoms and I could get things rolling. But at some point I feel like I need to look inside that nose. And I think that every new patient, even if I start it and do and can successfully start medications and talk about avoidance measures and talk about options for testing, I feel like I still need to look in their nose at some point in order to practice standard of care medicine. Does anyone have similar experience with that? Absolutely. Uh, I think um... I hope that we never have to do it again, but when uh, physical distancing in the office was an issue, one of the things that was advantageous for new patients specifically is, is we would do, for example, the bulk of the HPI, kind of a cursory exam, and get a lot of that legwork done via telemedicine, and then bring people in specifically for scope visits, um, where we would kind of be able to space the patients apart, make sure we have appropriate ventilation and sanitizing um, 
you know, procedures available. And that way we would do the scope visit and do, you know, a more thorough physical exam at that time, but it would limit the time in the office quite a bit because you've already done a bunch of your work uh, via telemedicine. And then from the coding perspective, it was just book, you know, coded as a, a procedure, 99999, you build the visit code at the time of the telemedicine visit, and then you just build the scope even though we kind of did document a more thorough physical exam, all we did was go for the scope uh, at that time. And so um, I hope we don't have to kind of make those accommodations again, but if you're trying to kind of limit time in the office so that you can get the ventilation in between um, scopes, you know, to clean out the rooms and, and keep the patients far apart, I think that that's where you can kind of almost do a hybrid approach um, for some of those patients. Can I ask a, a very brief, separate, but related question? Are you finding more and more that you have to prior authorize those endoscopy visits? No. I have not found that. Boy, in our area, we're starting to get that. Which area are you in? Uh, we are in Ohio, in Cincinnati, greater Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our, it started actually with our cancer docs, believe it or not. They, they were having to prior authorize their, their endoscopies. So what if they did the endoscopy at the time of the initial ENM? Yeah. Were those not punted I, or were they I, only reimbursing one? My guess is what started it was they were not being reimbursed for those and then they were doing them separately and then they had to get them prior authorized. I see. Now, I know that's not the topic for tonight, but it just it just brought up that question. I wondered what other people's experience was. So, I, I have a similar experience too, where I'll start the telemed and I'll bring them in just for the endoscopy. But it's interesting because you know we're we talk about standard of care and, and physical exam, and we also have a diverse group of allergy practitioners out there. And while we all are comfortable using endoscopes and have that ability. Not all allergists do. And I think that we've all either seen or heard of stories where patients come in on immunotherapy and they ended up not having the right diagnosis. They had, I knew one that had an angiofibroma. I knew one that had a tumor, an inverted papilloma, other lesions. And so these are all things that could have been diagnosed by performing endoscopy, but instead they were treated by someone who didn't do endoscopy we started someone on immunotherapy and then when it didn't work after a year or two years, they ended up. And so then the question of, you know, delayed diagnosis, standard of care, what would a reasonable practitioner do? It may not be always what we think it is because it's a, it's a heterogeneous group. And so it's a difficult question to determine like what is really the standard of care? Is there anyone here who, who, you know, does a, a initial telemed visit and doesn't follow up with an exam at some point? No, everyone agrees that's pretty much standard of care. Okay, excellent. I echo that. I had a I had a rhino lift recently. A patient who had a rhino lift for two years, two plus years, and um, treated with immunotherapy, no improvement. Um, and then the other the, sort of a correlator to that too. I'm sorry to uh, piggyback on that, Dr. Platt, but there's a maybe people have heard of it. There's a website called Get Curex, C U R E X. It's like a basically you can get Sublingual, sublingual immunotherapy after like a through the mail uh, pinprick allergy test. And it's, it's sort of like a step beyond no endoscopy. It's like, you know, no exam. It's a quick, quick telemedicine visit, I think with a nurse practitioner. And then you get your results after you get the pinprick and you get started on a slit. Anyway, I don't know if anybody heard of that, had any thoughts about that. It seems a little bit um, cursory to start somebody on a multi-year treatment for allergies with, without a heck of a lot of, um, you know, medical background or physical exam. Right. You know, I, I have not heard of that website, but I have heard of other companies that I think are doing similar things, which is taking a history and doing testing, whether that's with a pinprick or if it's other type of testing, but starting immunotherapy without a physical exam. And, you know, I would think that that is probably malpractice, practicing medicine without a physical exam. If you were to miss something, like an inverted papilloma that went into the eye or the brain or even a worse diagnosis, I think that you're practicing beyond the standard of care. I think that there's a lot of startups out there that are trying to capitalize on 
the fact that this is a really common disorder and that access to care is limited and that we could do better with access to care for, for you know, immunotherapy and the wait times are really high for many allergists. And so it, I agree, it's a challenge. I don't know what the right answer is, but my concern is, is that there are more than one. There are several companies that are practicing allergy and bypassing physical exam, let alone nasal endoscopy. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a lot of more and more of the, the sort of DIY concept to healthcare. And there's lots of companies that are willing to kind of jump into that and help patients out who sort of self-diagnose and then they'll get a test and then they'll do this. But, you know, as we teach our residents, the diagnosis of allergy is a complete history and physical examination and in the appropriate patient testing, you know, to, ele- to evaluate whether right. they're related IgE. And so that, I, and I don't think that's any different if you look at the internal medicine allergy folks. So I would say that probably is the standard of care. And I think that maybe I'm being Pollyannish, but I think that stuff will shake out. I, th- I think it'll, I mean, can you, um, I can imagine a scenario where somebody gets started like that and God forbid it happens, but they have an anaphylactic reaction. Um, how do you justify that if you've never even examined them? Or if, you know, so, and then, so, I, and I wonder who has the liability in that situation as well, who signs off. So it's kind of horrendous, but. Well, I'm sure that these are all the details that are worked out by the IP lawyers and the startups and all the investment money that goes into things like this, but. The question is, is the balancing, you know, the access issue to help patients versus the standard of care to help patients and what's good for the professionalism in medicine? Is it really professional to be practicing at that level or are the other interests outweighing the, what's best for the patient and staying within the standard of care? I agree with you. It will probably shake out over time. I want to ask another question about something that I think was controversial in the past, and that is home immunotherapy. Now, we all do home immunotherapy because we all do home sublingual immunotherapy, and that's standard of care, and it's FDA approved for the tablets. But when I started practicing 14 years ago, there was an older otolaryngologist who was practicing home immunotherapy. And many patients would come in, and they'd live further away, and he'd say, oh, it's easy. You get your first shot here, and then I give you this little Ziploc baggie that has your shots and needles and alcohol pads and this, and this uh, prescription that you take every week, you increase it by this much and, and patients would go home and they would do it. And I think that it was selected for those patients who knew something about medicine and who had people at home who could help them. And they did have an EpiPen, but this was the normal practice. And then as I learned more about it, I saw in the literature, in the general allergy literature, the practice parameters that specifically advised against that due to risks. And uh, we phased it out as that physician retired because I was concerned about practicing against published practice parameters by a very large accepted organization. Again, worried about the liability and practicing within the standard of care. There were still, I think, lots of practitioners who continue doing it because that's what they always did. And the practice parameter doesn't specifically bar it from happening. It, there, it does leave a little leeway in there for, for patients. And I've also heard them present, the people on that panel, that said that if you have someone who's really far away and has no access and you're in the middle of nowhere, that they really can't come in for their shots, it's better to do that than nothing. And so I'm curious to get the opinion of people currently I don't practice home injection immunotherapy because of those reasons, but is anyone else still doing it? So um, do you differentiate when you say that between building and maintenance? Right. I don't do it for any of the above. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, it's interesting. Uh, I will say that we end up giving a lot of shots for outside allergists of um, college students that are at our institution. They present to us with their little baggie and their, and their sheet of paper. Um, and we are asked to follow that regimen. 
Um, and so I've seen that it's, it absolutely goes on. We, our policy as is that there's no exceptions that during the building phase, shots have to be done. Uh, and and the, the thought process is we want to know from week to week how they're doing to decide mm -hmm. whether to go to the next step. Plus, that's the most common time if anaphylaxis is going to occur, for it to occur, et cetera, et cetera. Once they are getting the same dose every week on maintenance, if they have either a particular expertise, we take care of a lot of folks that are within the system and they have somebody at home that can help it, and they have to know how to use the EpiPen and sign off when we talk about risk. But we, we will let them on maintenance go ahead and do that at our program. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say it's, it's of those that choose to do it, it's actually a fairly small percentage. A lot of them prefer coming in and having it done, sort of forces mm -hmm. them to do it every week. Um, uh, but, but we do have some that, that ask for it and I, and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and do that once they're on maintenance. I do similar as well. Um, no one is allowed to do their shots at dancing at home, but once they're at maintenance, if we assess this as a competent patient, uh, intelligent patient, uh, they've, you know, my nurse can get the sense as to. Uh, how they're going to be. Um, she will work on trying to teach them to administer the shot. They have to demonstrate, give themselves a couple shots under her um, observation, her, her coaching. If they're able to do that and they will have somebody at home when they will do the shots, then we will allow people on maintenance to do that at home with an EpiPen, someone at home, competent patient. So I practice in the central New York. So we have a lot of rural uh, medicine patients. And so access uh, and people being able to uh, come in for a weekly injection is quite challenging. But I still don't uh, allow home immunotherapy. So the hybrid kind of compromise that I've come to is that they have to be able to find a provider of some sort you know, in a place where they have um, an EpiPen available, there's somebody observing them for the 30 minutes. So even if it's an hour away necessarily from my office, whether it be, you know, a nurse under the supervision of someone, whatnot, people get it from the school nurse, actually, in some of the schools, they'll get their immunotherapy and they're observed and they, someone's able to call EMS should there be an issue and there's an EpiPen available. So what I'll do is I'll do the vial prep the vial test and the first dose in my office, you know, every 12 weeks. And then they go with like their little baggie and instruction sheet on ice to go to that provider that's closer to their rural area. But again, it's contingent on the fact that it's still really given by a medical profession with an area that can be observed uh, with availability to certain medications and access to EMS should it be necessary. So you know, you don't want to not have people do it, right, because of the access, but there, you know, we try to figure out like a hybrid safe setting. So, and, and, you know, the vial prep and the vial test for me are a big deal in my office. And then for the nurses to follow the schedule and give me a call if there's a local reaction, things like that. Like I give some thorough instructions in terms of what's a small local reaction versus large local reaction, et cetera. You know, there's like a little protocol that I'm sending the patients with and then the nursing staff or whoever with other providers can call me. I have a lot of the college, um, you know, uh, medical offices or, you know, student health, excuse me, call me and, you know, say, well, this is what's been going on. And we kind of uh, do it almost remotely, but with with kind of appropriate parameters. If I could just make one comment, when I was trying to come up with the policies for our program, I read back to some old literature, Houston King and, and some other folks wrote a lot about when errors occur. And one of the points that they made that I thought was pretty important when folks at outside practitioners are giving the shots, you want to be sure they understand allergy. That decimal point is real important. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people are used to giving IM doses of antibiotics and the volumes are quite a bit different from the volumes that we're giving. And so whenever we do that, 
my allergy nurses talk to the nurses that are going to be giving those shots to, so that, to be certain that they understand these are tiny little volumes. If you look back at the audits that were done in England of patients getting immunotherapy in, in uh, these were done in a GP's office uh, prepared by an allergist and they had a high rate of death. And in fact, that's part of the reason that there became a push to do um, sublingual immunotherapy from what I understand. Um, so yeah, you, you have to be a little circumspect about, about the outside physician or you know, feeling that, that that's gonna solve the issue. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, mean, I sometimes trust my educated patient uh, to do it the right way. They're, they're obviously a big stakeholder in the process. I also have a large college health population like Al and Heidi, and I get vials that come in from allergists around the country. And one thing I'm always surprised at is just the variation in number of vials and dosing schemes. And uh, it's just it's different for every single general allergist out there. I've never seen two that were the same. I think that as a AOA member, and we teach pretty much one way to do it when we're talking about injections, they have many different ways to do it. Not that there's a right or wrong. It's just there are different dosing schemes and different theories about how many allergens you have to break up. And the purists that will only put one in one vial versus those that do multi-antigens. And so that's always interesting. And I've never turned away vials. I will do it by the regimen that is sent to me. And I don't think I've ever been uncomfortable with the regimen that was given. But the reverse is that we used to send, we have 17 or 18 health centers that are affiliated with my hospital around the region. And it used to be fairly common that we would send out vials to those health centers and people in their neighborhood could get their injections after they came and started the escalations at our office. We released the vials and that was it. And, and over the years, that has pretty much gone away. The health centers are no longer comfortable giving injections. I don't know exactly why, if that's the staff has changed and there's turnover, or if they don't want to assume the risk of giving the injections. But my experience is that nowadays that health centers and PCPs aren't as interested in doing that and being in the allergy shot uh, business as they have been in the past. Has anyone had a similar uh, experience that their finance is limited in terms of PCPs being interested in giving injections? Yeah, that, that's gone away for me as well. Uh, pretty, I mean, not 100%, but, but a fair amount of uh, vials that I would send out. Um, they just don't feel comfortable doing it. They don't want, and it's really, they don't want to assume the risk. That's what, mm -hmm. that's what I'm told. The other so. factor that may be at play, Mike, is there's no physician work in the RVUs. And so, and especially if they're in a health system that they're assuming the risk, but not getting the financial credit. So that may be another factor mm -hmm. impacting um, mm -hmm. other groups wanting to take that on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had uh, a, a large group of uh, clinics in a grocery store chain here, Kroger's, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but that they have something in there called the little clinic staffed by uh, APPs, primarily nurse practitioners, and they actually turned it off. They At first, they sought out that business and they actually turned it off. That, and it is the lie, but they told us it was the liability issue. They didn't feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So while we're talking about remote practice, I think a very important question has come up about treating across state lines. And during the pandemic, everything was suspended. I think all of our regulations, and I was allowed to treat people throughout New England because people were not able to travel. And we have patients in Rhode Island, in New Hampshire, and in Maine. And we, we saw everyone and anyone, and it was perfectly fine, acceptable, and the state regulations were adjusted to allow that to happen. Since then, everything has been tightened up. And I was told that on telehealth, I'm only allowed to see people in Massachusetts. And there's a verification button that I have to hit that says this patient is in Massachusetts. And so that comes from my license. I'm only licensed in Massachusetts and my malpractice carrier only covers me for practicing within my license. And so I'm interested to hear, do other people have state uh, limitations where they're not able to practice telemed across state lines? Is that a similar experience? 
we have to be licensed in the state. We're we're uh, we have three states together here: Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. And you have to have license, and you have to be verified. And the verification process you you refer to is true here as well. Um, and I would think in New England, I mean, you can throw a stone and hit three states. So so you know, it's it's interesting that they're doing that. Um, you're right; it was suspended during the pandemic, but it it has it has been pulled back. And so I do know some providers in Boston who have now gotten state licenses in Rhode Island and New Hampshire in Maine, so that gives them the ability to do telehealth throughout New England. Has anyone expanded their licensure so they can do expanded telehealth? No. I, I held both the Kentucky and Ohio from the beginning, so. Uh -huh. For that reason. Both. Yeah, for that reason. And so then the issue also comes up with mailing of slit vials. Now, I don't mail slit vials. We never have, but I do know others that do. And so uh, I'm interested, does everyone here mail slit renewal vials? So it, these are great questions because these are really issues that come up. Um, we, we do um, accept, we're reluctant to do it in the summer. We're afraid they're gonna get heated up and denatured. Um, we're, we're more likely to do it in the wintertime, uh, for that reason. We've had, we've had in the past some vials that sat somewhere and by the time they were delivered, the patients let us know that it, that they were warm and they had sat out and we ended up having to make them new vials and have them come in and pick it up. So in the summer, we actually don't mail them. <laughs> and then if you put dry ice in there, you could also freeze them, correct? Yeah, you go the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. That's and the so, only issue, uh, yeah. This, that. And, and you mail it only to the states where you have a license and not to other states? Is that a limitation? I, no, no, I have to say, I have mailed slit vials to states where I don't have a license, where people are traveling, college students going the other way. You know, uh -huh. they, they started here and they're going to school out of state and they're getting their vial out of state. Um, and is there concern I'm about practicing? I haven't even thought of that until you brought that up. Practicing in a different state without a license? Is it? I don't know. We did it up here. Well, we started here. Boy, that's the... What no, if their I permanent address is where you live? You know? Say again? If their permanent address is where you live, then uh, yeah, like, it's like sometimes we'll have, we'll have patients that go to Florida, you know, for the month and they'll need something. So I've sent scripts to their pharmacy in Florida. Mm -hmm. So I never thought that was practicing across state lines, but I, I didn't define it that way myself. <laughs> so Wes, I agree with you. Be you know, I have patients who are traveling and are sick and they get yeah. sick and they need medications and I'll talk to them on the phone, right. but I won't charge for a visit by just talking to the phone, right. but I will prescribe and I can do it in Epic. I can electronically prescribe to a pharmacy in Florida and I do that and I still don't consider that practicing across state lines. I think that would change, that changes though, if I'm gonna bill for it as a telehealth, right? I can't, I was told I can't do that. And if I were to mail them something from Massachusetts, I guess I would have to consult legal to say whether that was practicing across state lines as opposed to just prescribing at a pharmacy. Yeah, my problem with consulting legal is every time you consult legal, the answer is no, no, don't do it. Um, <laughs> But, but I have to say, I suspect that that phone call where you're not billing for it, but that phone call where you're prescribing, you have a doctor-patient relationship and you have the liability of that visit. I, I, I'm fairly sure of that um, for what that's worth, but. <laughs> Great, now you have some, something else to worry about. We don't. <laughs> You know, Al, the thing is, that these are complicated issues. I don't think anyone has the right answer. Yeah. And we're all trying to do what's best for our patients and make this work. And I don't think that anyone's going to fault you for continuing to practice within the standard of care. I think that the things that people get nailed for when they go outside and start doing things that aren't within the standard of care. So uh, 
I, I do prescribe, and I think you could justify that maybe mailing is the same as prescribing. You know, what's the difference? And no one's going to argue with you calling in a script for a patient in Florida who needs a script. And you've spoken to them and documented what they need. Steve, did you want to add something to that? Uh, I just wanted to ask one thing. I, I don't take care of uh, many kids that are in college being at uh, not at, a, at the facility where the college students are at. So um, it's always been my impression that general allergists end up tolerating a higher rate of anaphylaxis in their advancement and uh, protocols than, than ENT. They tend to advance more rapidly, et cetera. Have you experienced that in taking care of some of these patients, uh, just adopting the regimen that comes in with them? Have you, have you noticed that in your practice? Fortunately, I have not, but I have noticed that they do go up to higher concentrations than I typically do. And I also think that part of that uh, statistic is that they also have a sicker population, a more asthma population than my population. And so even though I see that they have higher numbers of rates of anaphylaxis, they also have patients who are more at risk. And I think that we tend to see more of the nasal patients and they see more of the asthma patients. And so I don't know how real it is that it's just their dosing, but I definitely do see they go up higher dosing than I typically go up. But fortunately, I haven't seen anaphylaxis from, in their patients. And we haven't seen anaphylaxis in any of those either, Steve. Uh, I agree um, that with Mike that they do tend to go a little quicker and maybe some higher concentrations. Um, we see a fair amount of asthmatics referred from pulmonology um, that they're having trouble controlling and they want to get their allergies controlled so that they can have improved control. So we're honestly, I'm, I'm almost more worried about exacerbating asthma and, and getting them into status asthmaticus than I am about anaphylaxis. I mean, I'm worried about anaphylaxis like anybody else that does allergy, but um, we've had more issues on the asthma side, and we probably have a higher acuity pulmonary allergy group anyway. Um, so, but that is, that's part of it. Our nurses are trained to ask the asthma questions. You know, have you been, how, how often have you used your rescue inhaler? Are you doing what you're supposed to do? Are you taking your maintenance inhaler, et cetera? Are you short of breath? They're listening to their chest. They're, they're even doing um, some uh, brief pulmonary function testing on the ones that seem to be having more issues. Um, then they check uh, at least an FEV1 before and, and uh, 20 minutes after the shot, those kinds of things on the asthma. So I think if you're doing more asthma and if your traveling patient is an asthmatic, I think maybe you, you may want to look at those patients a little bit differently and have a, little, a few more sort of checks and balances in place for that. Excellent. And so we made it through 45 minutes. I'd like to just open up. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the remote practice of allergy? Anything we haven't covered? Any new questions? All right. Well, this has been can a wonderful- I, Can I get one question? I was waiting Absolutely. to see if the crowd wanted to ask anything, but yes. I briefly mentioned, so for a period of time, and I think this was the way it was in Boston, as I recall talking to you before, where during the social distancing piece where we were trying not to have a lot of patients come in, some allergy practices basically halted. Um, some had like a drive-through allergy practice. And I think some of our members have spoken about that. Some did something else. Um, I think most of us can agree that, that in a patient who's compromised by their allergies, whether sinonasal compromise or pulmonary compromise, if they don't get their allergy shots, it makes the rest of that disease worse. So we made the argument when they were asking us to shut it down that these patients would end up, or at least a percentage of these patients are gonna end up coming into the system just when you didn't want them in the emergency room, when there were lots and lots of COVID patients in the emergency rooms and urgent care facilities. So we won that argument in our, in our institution, mm -hmm. at least for the patients that wanted to come in, needed to come in. We, we isolated them from the rest of the patients and we, and we rolled them through and, and 
were able to do that fairly successfully. And I was just wondering what other people felt about that, especially now there's actually some data out there showing that allergy patients got sicker during the pandemic that couldn't get their, their allergy treatments. Yeah, I mean, there was, it was all unknown. And remember when it first started, everything was shut down because it was complete fear. You know, I remember running in the first week, running outside without a mask, and someone was screaming at me from the other side of the block, like, where's your mask? Like, nowadays, that wouldn't happen. And so we didn't know that biologics were safe, right? Some people were thinking about stopping biologics. We didn't know that immunotherapy was safe. We didn't know that steroids were okay. Some people were proposing not, you know, stopping steroids because they're immune suppressing. And later we find out that steroids are helpful. And treat, continue to treat lung diseases is helpful to keep people out of the emergency room. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. We, we shut down because that's what we thought was the safest thing. And we stopped the allergy injection clinic and all care. And the next time it happens, I agree, we'll probably be more like you and keep things going and try to keep people safe and healthy and out of the ED. Great. Just curious about that. Thanks. Yeah, you were right, Al. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Um, it, but I think it, it's nice to have maybe a consent. If it comes up again and, you know, I don't know, monkey pox or something else, it might come up again. <laughs> no, I don't think it'll be monkey pox. I don't mean that. That's not a, a statement. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, we're, we're prime for pandemics these days. So That's um, right. Yeah. Right. We will do it better the second time. Unfortunately, they, they typically only happen once in someone's lifetime, right? So we have to pass this information on, hopefully. Yeah. 1918 to 2022, however long that was, yeah. Yeah. That's my lifetime, 102, <laughs> under four years. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It was really enjoyable, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone at the next live office hours, which is at the basic course in Florida. So everyone have a wonderful night. Look forward to seeing you then. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.